right. Hello to people live in Philly. Uh, and hello to our friends uh, joining us on Zoom or on HowlRound. My name is Todd London. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. I am on the board of the network of ensemble theaters. And um, today, a day we're calling Breakthrough, which is a big day of a lot of different events, is happening live from Philly and hybrid over Zoom and for part of the day over HowlRound um, and will be recorded so uh, people will be able to watch after the event as well. And this is um, our first experiment at NET in hybrid gathering. Um, we've been online for the past two and a half years and before that we were never online. We were always in person in really specific um, locales with a deep connection to place. And so this is um, a big experiment for us. And you are already part of that experiment because we've started 15 minutes late while we got the technical stuff up and running. But we're really grateful to the, um, to the tech wizards here uh, at the neighborhood house in um, Philadelphia. And uh, we'll be here all day. So there's a lot going on. Um, our executive director, Alicia Tonsik, was going to welcome everybody, but she's handling a lot of the logistics of this complicated day. And she'll be in from time to time during the day to talk about the day, to talk about NET, to welcome you. Um, but I am your guy for the moment. And um, we're here for a really exciting starter event um, that is near and dear to my heart because it involves um, an old collaborator of mine, Jan Cohn Cruz, a colleague, and uh, a newer but deep collaborator of Jan's, Rad Pereira, who have written a book, um, collected a book, edited a book, written a book, <laughs> researched a book with almost a hundred um, interviews with. Um, people from many generations who are doing socially engaged work across the US. Um, it's a profound book. I've, I'm not, I, have, I can't say I've finished it, but I've certainly started it. And one of the things that I just want to mention that is um, particularly profound is that with something like 40 year difference between them, Rad and Jan are, um, exploring, modeling, experimenting with um, real deep cross-generational research and communication. And um, as you'll hear, their book deals with people who are newly practicing in, or fairly newly practicing in the field of socially engaged theater now, and people who have been doing it for 50 and 60 years. The, bo the book um, spans 1965 to 2020, 2020. 2020, and it is now, believe it or not, 2022. So um, they're going to work with us some and talk some about the book today. Um, but before they do, I want to just uh, read a little introduction to them. Rad Pereira is a queer immigrant artist and culture worker, cultural worker building consciousness between healing justice, system change, reindigenation, and queer futures. Based in the Lenape Hoking, Brooklyn, and the Haudenosaunee territory, Shoni territory, which is the northern Hudson Valley now. Their work in performance, education, and social practice has been experienced on stages, screens, stoops, and sidewalks all over Turtle Island through the support of many communities, institutions, and groups. They co-founded Are You Here, an ever-evolving organism of art, performance, and healing created with and for the QT2SGNCI plus and BIPOC communities. They are building a native-led food sovereignty project called Iron Path Farms. And that's Rad Pereira. And Jan Cohn Cruz's previous publications include Local Acts, Engaging Performance and Remapping Performance. She edited Radical Street Performance and co-edited Playing Bawal 
and a Boal companion with Mady Schutzman. She worked with a blade of grass supporting socially engaged artists as director of field research and co-founder of its magazine. She directed Imagining America, Artists and Scholars in Public Life, and co-founded its journal, Public. In 2023, Jan will collaborate with Mark Valdez and Ashley Sparks on a new iteration of The Most Beautiful Home, Maybe, in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Rad and Jan. Uh, we will unmask when we're talking today and mask when we are not. And here we go. Thank you, Todd. Um, would those of you who are here live, and we're so glad that you're here live, would you just tell us your name and your affiliation? Let's just get a sense of who's like physically in the room with us. Thank you, Jan. Um, my name is Severin Blake, pronouns they, all, we. Uh, I am here representing the company Applied Mechanics. Hi there, I'm Shivana Lachlan. Uh, I'm um, a performance artist in Los Angeles and I'm, um, I'm I think officially the, the DJ for the afternoon sessions. <laughs> Hi, I'm Liam Gable. I use they and he pronouns. I teach uh, acting and directing at Lehigh University, and I'm also a maker and director. I have a new collaboration called Future Ghost. Hi, my name is Brenna. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm here representing Diecast. Intergeneration collaboration. Yeah, there you go. I am Dionisio Cruz, and I'm Jan's husband. Hey, y'all. I'm Rad Pereira. I use they, them pronouns. Um, yeah, thank you for being here. I'm representing, Todd said what, some of what I'm, who I'm representing. So that's You Are Here and Iron Path Farms. Yeah, and if folks in the chat at home want to put in the comments who they are, where they're from, and what groups they're with, we'd love to hear from you too. Great. Um, so I just want to say a few words about the book and to let you know some of the grounding for the book. So then the workshop, so the first third were sort of grounding the workshop in some of the ideas um, that were so, that we learned so much from all the people we interviewed. Um, and then we'll do the hands-on workshop that comes out of it. So, so there it was early 2020, little did we know what was in store. And I got very interested in um, I, I wanted to, I, I was very struck by all the different ways that socially engaged theater has been called. There was political theater and activist theater and social practice and civic practice and, it, and socially engaged theater. And then there are people who don't call it anything, but they do it. They're in ensemble companies. They're, they're very embedded with the people that they live amongst. Um, there are people who talk about ritual. There are people who do very theatricalized um, therapy. And I just wanted the left hand to know what the right hand was doing. And I thought, wouldn't it be great also generationally to look at in what ways um, is there work where I can see values in common, a sense that in addition to aesthetics, theater is so capable of accomplishing things or working towards um, a sort of things that are also instrumental in our lives together. Um, and how has that changed? How is it different? So I, I, I started doing this, and and I one of the people I interviewed is um, a, a person half my age, Rad Pereira, whose work I'd admired um, in in when she when they were part of a, a project for the city of New York, working with uh, the administration of children and family services. Interviewing Rad made me realize, uh oh, I want Rad to write this book with me. I don't want to just interview Rad, not only, Rad is obviously of another generation, another mindset, we share values. The people that they've worked with over the last 15 years are not people I've worked with, and that if we're really gonna do this book, that would be important. And so indeed, that's what we did. And the only other thing I wanna say by way of introduction is, 
it was very tricky as someone whose my career has largely been writing about performance. It was very tricky to not have too many ideas about what the book was about. If the whole point was the people we were interviewing were going to tell us what was important to them, I had to try to step back. And so like even in the first chapter, which is about history, well, I mean, I knew that everybody was going to say, um, oh, yes, uh, uh, um, of course, it, it, the group theater was certainly important. And then some people said, the group theater, why would I care about the group theater? And we realized we really had to find out people's legacies without assuming any one history. And what we heard, in fact, were a, a, kind of this exciting histories. And there's the first chapter. I pass on to Rad to talk about subsequent chapters briefly. <laughs> sure, thanks, Jan. Um, yeah, and then the second part you know, oh. my second chapter. Where'd my notes go? Do, 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 do. Yes, the second chapter <laughs> <laughs> was about commitments and like what are the values that we do all share and how are folks walking these values and embodying these values and holding those those questions as kind of the thing that like propels the work constantly. And so that's when we were organizing the book, we were like, oh, this isn't chronological, this is thematic, you know? And that was like a huge thing in everybody's work was the values and the value systems that they were trying to abide by. Yeah. And then in the third chapter, we thought about, because we'd heard a lot about education, like here's something that nearly stopped me entirely, where what was important to me was so um, dissed. And, and someone else saying, oh, well, this is something that if I hadn't met Robbie McCauley at that moment, I don't know how I would have developed in the way that I have. Uh, and then the fourth chapter. Then we got into part two, remapping community. And we wanted to understand how identity grounders kind of transformed and um, address the way people were working and wanted to work. Um, so that was about changing notions of who we are and how we are working together. Um, or not. Know, or not, absolutely. And um, we wanted to hold people accountable to mistakes they'd also made in the past, you know, and how they're addressing that today. And so we wanted to show like a broad spectrum of how, yeah, how we're doing that or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then in the last section, which is regenerativity, um, getting us, oh no, I'm sorry, there's one more chapter in remapping and that's community-centric civic collaborations. One thing that there's been more of in the last, since 2010, for particular reasons, is artists embedded in municipal partnerships and other civic partnerships. Well, it's partly because of Art Place, which just got millions and millions of dollars, so for 10 years, that's what they would fund. And of course, once there's somebody funding something, other people say, this must be the thing to fund. And so there was a lot of that. And some of that work um, we think is really valuable. And it wasn't that it just began then, it just got more attention. And, um, and some of it we found very challenging. And the, more importantly, the artists we spoke to found challenging, such as uh, collaborating with police is one of the things we get into in the book. And, um, how do you negotiate why a department in a municipal government was started and trying to bring progressive ideas in? How do you do that? That's tricky, if, if at all, if even possible at all. Yeah, which led us to our final uh, section, which is regenerativity and why we're here today. Um, you know, Maria Rosario Jackson did this report almost 10 years ago about what, how, what makes a sustainable life in the arts and after reading that and talking about that, we wanted to see what is beyond sustainability and that is regenerativity. You know, like sustainability can oftentimes be about maintaining the status quo and like getting to a place of survival. And we were curious about, okay, what's, what's beyond that? You know, like what, where, where, where do we want to um, grow, grow into and like transform, transform towards? So, we, we talk a lot about some of, the, some of the tenets within the solidarity economy and how we can apply that into our arts and culture and theater work, um, which led us to our final chapter, which was the year was 2020 and about how, you know, um, how we dealt, 
how we've been dealing with COVID, uh, the, the kind of, we talk about pandemic time as like this portal that holds so much space for transformation and for um, really finally like listening to our bodies and our collective body about what we want to be growing, growing into. And so today, of course, we're gonna focus on this chapter six, what we learned about regenerativity. And really there were six elements that recurred when we spoke, or when we were in conversation with artists, they just came up again and again. So like, whereas you might think the first thing you would hear was money. Well, of course we need money. And of course we do need money, but that was not the first thing. The first thing was calling, was recognizing that you had a calling for the kind of work you were doing and that you felt you were doing what matters to you in the world. And that that is regenerative. That is something, it, it's sustaining, but it's more than that. It's, um, it, it, it makes you wanna go further than you're going, no matter what the circumstances. And just to give one example, since we're then gonna be asking you all for examples, um, this is a guy named Bob Leonard. He's a director and a theater professor at uh, Virginia Tech. And he told a story from um, back in the 60s during the Vietnam War when he was in a theater company in Washington. Um, I was doing a play with the Washington Theater Club while protests against the Vietnam War were happening in front of the embassy just down the road. Tear gas was seeping into the building, which was awful, but also emblematic. We were doing this play which had nothing to do with what was going on in the street. And we had the residual consequence of tear gas. And I didn't have time to march against the war. I had a family, I had to work, but I was struck by how particularly irrelevant I was that night. It wasn't the play, it was a great play. It was that I wasn't where I was supposed to be. I eventually took another direction and found I could go where I needed to go and make theater that was satisfying. Not entirely, I wanted it to be better every time, but I was realizing my own intentionality. So that is one element of regenerativity we'll be um, asking you about. Uh, a second element. Great, and then the next one that we did notice folks talking about was where to live, right? And how being place-based can, uh, can kind of soothe so many of the anxieties and the unfulfillingness that comes from sort of operating just in non-place-based uh, theater institutions. And I'll quote um, Carlton Turner, who said, in 2017, my partner Brandy and I founded the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production in my home community. This space, which focuses on community-centered design, cultural production, and community development, uses food and story as binders for collective transformation. This institution is grounded in many of the values and theories of change written about in this book. Um, so that's part of what we wanted to do too, was highlight how folks are remaining place-based and how they're finding regenerativity specifically within their community. Uh, the next element, and we've got these written down, so <laughs> when we ask you to do them, we don't expect you to remember them, this is not a test. Um, is the idea of finding community. And this is a quote by um, uh, Rihanna Yazi, who's the director of the New Native Theater in Minneapolis, I think. I don't see the point of doing theater if it's not with Native people who have lived experience of being Native, because at the end of the day, for me, I believe the reason that we are doing theater as Native people is to recoup what we've lost. Now we're not saying in every case, finding community means going just to a group that you share a fundamental identity with. We're saying that's one of the ways that one of the artists we spoke with finds community and it's a, it's a powerful way and it is a recurring theme. I'm sure it's very familiar to everyone listening to this. Um, and then our next one is about communicating beyond one's own peeps to quote Kathy Dinobrega um, who says, even when I was mayor of my little town, I kept thinking, this is just a secret play. I'm the director, no one even knows they're in a play. <laughs> in a play, people want something, they have to do things to get it, there's conflicts and obstacles, and they have to work together. 
The residents of my town don't know they're in a show, but I know it. So how do we make the best outcome possible? Um, yeah, Kathy's contributions were like just amazing because she it was really cool to hear how she brought her theater toolkit to you know bringing her town together and literally being the mayor of her town. Well, yeah, very cool. Um, representation in policy decisions. And this gets into another one of the themes of the book, which really is extending beyond uh, what you might have learned in theater school in being able to have a regenerative life in, um, in the field as you continue. And one is recognizing who's making decisions that are affecting my work and how do I make sure I have a place at the table um, because as Carol Bebel said, and Carol is the director of the Ashe Cultural Center in New Orleans, um, if you don't have a seat at the table, you might be on the menu. So that's a, sort of one of the most sort of direct and straightforward uh, uh, expressions of, it may be that we really need to know a lot about a lot more of a lot of things besides theater, which I think everybody knows anyway. I mean all the many hats you wear, but this policy hat we go into in some depth um, in the book. And then our last kind of section about regenerativity is about making a living. And we'll quote our friend Liz Lerman who said, um, our idea was sell your knowledge, not your dances. We had a touring engagement model. I told presenters that everyone in the company could do two things and could do two things a day in the community. Although later it became three weeks or six months, in the initial period it was one-shot deals, which could be life-changing but weren't enough. People were happy for me to do a concert piece as a culmination of the time there, but we would also we would we also were in schools, prisons, rehab centers, whatever. Jawole of Urban Bush Women shared that the intention that everyone who came through our companies should be able to do a number of things, teach, collaborate, listen, be in a community setting, help people do something they wanna do. We were unique and therefore people were interested. Now many, many people can do what I just described, uh, which then we go into, Paul Bonin Rodriguez talks about like your economic engine versus your social engine and how being able to kind of delineate what is, gonna, what is gonna fulfill the social engine and what's gonna fulfill the economic engine having to be hand in hand to actually be able to do this kind of work, you know, like with integrity and in a deep way, wherever you go. Great. Um, and so Todd um, happily has a list of those eight elements of regenerativity, which can you see, can, can people see that pretty well? or at all? <laughs> Wonderful, we'll, we're, we'll, which we'll get to in just a moment. Thank you, Todd, you can put, you don't have to hold it this second, I'm gonna just say one thing before I will ask you to hold it. So that, so that the structure of this workshop, um, Freedom Dreaming, um, is rooted in a long tradition of black radical thought and action. And there are three steps to it. The first step is that it invites us to create the world we, we dream of, it invites us to create the world we dream of by first step, identifying what we've already done. It does not suggest, no, we start at zero. How are we gonna do it? We're gonna say, well, we've done things along this way. Let's identify them. Let's hear what other people identify and then say, oh yeah, that's something, that's a thing, I've done that. Um, and then there'll be a second step and a third step, which we'll talk you through when we get there. So for this first step, which is what you've already done, this is where we turn to you all sitting around the circle. And if those prompts help you, these eight, now, if you don't mind holding it again, Todd, that would be great, thank you. And people who are connecting through Zoom, I don't know. Um, put it in the chat. Yes, that would be great if you'd Please. put it in the chat and we, I think we count on, on Todd who will, there's a bunch of things in the chat and, and as we hear from you, Todd will feed into us what people are saying in the chat so we can say it out loud and it'll be, we'll, we'll try to combine it as part of the conversation. Great. So starting with this idea of knowing your calling or any of those that landed with you, I, I, I'm inviting those of you around the circle to talk about what do you see as some of the steps you've already taken to bring your work into the way you 
most envision it and the world in which it sits the way you most envision it. Wonderful. Would you read that for us, Todd? Ah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Right. So in terms of embrace one's calling, I mean, was there a moment for anyone when you thought, yes? <laughs> um, I'll do two points of like one's calling. The first time was in um, high school. I did a solo mime. Uh, the teacher gave us a prompt like here, have a piece of music, make a piece that's five minutes long. And I was really digging into like domestic violence at that time. And so I made a piece about a person who leaves a situation at the end, um, essentially in the morning. And it, for me, it was something that I was working out for myself. And then like, I noticed that it started, it, it touched people, people cried. I like took it to competition. I lost to a really great environmental piece about like saving animals, which is also like deeply, deeply also real because animals are also people, people are also animals. But um, then I got asked to take the piece to take back the night. And I was like, oh, it's that affecting. And so I was like, that was my calling. It's taken me a while to come back around to that calling. <laughs> uh, but so for heal healing is like the space that really lights me up. Um, yeah. Um, in speaking about, uh, I guess, 2020, I, uh, I'm, a, you know, an activist as well as an artist, right? And I um, was a big, like, Bernie person and super devastated in um, April. And what I ended up doing uh, was starting a collective of artists. Um, we're called the Misfits for Democracy, but I got together a bunch of radical theater makers to phone bank for Joe Biden, and nobody wanted to do it, and everyone was upset, but we... I took the time before every session and to check in with every person who would come and our group started having 50 people, you know, and I gave them space to talk about how they were doing. And then we like put in the work and we put in over 40,000 calls to Pennsylvania. And then we adopted uh, John Ossoff in Georgia after that and Raphael Warnock. And we've continued and we're now gonna be doing uh, Wisconsin for Mandela Barnes and John Fetterman here. Um, because we want to swing the Senate. So it's not, I don't even like doing it, <laughs> but we were utilizing, um, you know, uh, pedagogy and theater of the oppressed. We were util utilizing nonviolent communication and taking our skills as artists to talk to voters. And, um, you know, as artists, we have so many skills, but we're seen as like skillless, <laughs> you know, by the capitalist like economy. And when you bring people together and say like your emotions, your feelings, your like your bigness, you know, is so valuable in terms of like making the world a safer place. And, and often that just meant listening to people on the phone and like talking to them about some stuff to try to like swing some votes. So that is kind of, I guess a, a form of like a calling of like, I don't want to do this, but I'm gonna, cause I don't, I don't know what else to do right now with myself, you know? Yes. The way you pulled together the 50 other people. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Shared identity with the most, yeah. Yeah. Right. And, also connecting and also connecting one's work beyond the immediate circle. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. which I realized we didn't give an example of that, but this thing of, 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 of that is one of the other elements of uh, connecting one's work beyond the um, immediate circle. Thank you. Oh yeah, yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> I can I can try. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of two moments right now. And one is, it was so wild to hear all those people's being quoted. And so many of them are people that I have been around for the past, like over a decade now. And to think about first coming to Alternate Roots and feeling like I was brought there by Dr. Tanya Pettiford Waits. 
um, who was doing work with the conciliation project, which really cracked me open. And being in that community and knowing like, oh, I just wanna know more of what these people know. Um, and then kind of awkwardly <laughs> uh, asking questions and like following people around trying to figure things out. Um, felt like a moment of understanding something about the calling. And then another was um, when I first started doing alleged lesbian activities with Last Call, that's now being run by Indy Mitchell and Natalie Nia Falk in New Orleans. Um, and we were interviewing people about lesbian bars and uh, we had a party to try to raise money for it. And it was just like the house party was so huge and everybody was so excited about this like play that we were making that we had no idea what it was. And I felt, um, like, oh, this is something, like gathering people is something, and this is part of the work, and how does this become, I don't know more what it needs to be, yeah. I love that, gathering people is something. Which reminds me of one of my favorite Liz Lerman <laughs> quotes. When she realized that a circle was something, she said, oh, when we, so often in ensemble theater and in the arts in general, we convene in a circle, we're setting everyone up equally, by the physical space, that's a thing we do. I have to recognize that as a skill. Gathering people is a skill. That's, yeah, Todd, please. I I really want to participate, but I'm manning the uh, Zoom feed too. Um, apparently, if Zoom folks want to speak, their cameras will be spotlit and show up on our big video screen. So we might, as part of the experiment of the day, Please. encourage that. Um, so I don't know how to do that, except maybe call on Nicole, who is manning Zoom, to just feed people in if they want to speak. Great. Is there any, anything you want to say? Just did you, did you get the chats? And is there any- there were, No, there it? were no other chats, there were no other this, chats. Not, okay. as of yet that have been fed through to me. Gotcha, thanks. So this is really like, this is how we do it. We give the old guy <laughs> the technology to like do it. No, they make us learn. <laughs> yes. Yes, is there anyone on Zoom who, and hopefully now those points are in the chat. <laughs> is there anyone on Zoom who would, I see there's 21 comments. It's killing me, right? What, what are they saying? Um, please. I know that I spoke earlier about myself, but I just wanted to talk about my theater company, Applied Mechanics. Um, I think that for Seat at the Table and Policy Decisions, uh, we have been members of the Philadelphia Coalition for Affordable Communities for about five years before the pandemic started. And like, so like all of our other work kind of was like on hold and we were shifting and figuring out how to make our worlds move forward and we have, but specifically we then had more time to be present um, and be available to like make actions that were uh, socially distanced and um, also safe and fun and interesting and help with those campaigns um, throughout the pandemic. And that has been, yeah. It's been interesting. It's been, it's a work. And so we also have to like figure out how to like, that kind of fits into make a living. So it's like, how do we make sure that being an organizer is a lot of work. And so is also being an artist and also being an administrator. Um, so yeah, figuring out how to get that balance. So having representation, so I, it's, it looks like people have um, put in chat, I, I'm thinking maybe what resonates with them of the elements. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. Great, so now people can type messages in and we can all see them, you all on Zoom, we're now seeing what you're putting in chat. Um, but it's, it's since no one's putting anything in chat at the moment, <laughs> I was going to say, Rad, you up there's something, and then Rad, you might want to move on to the second point. Oh, well, Bill if, George wrote, loving it. Thanks, Bill. Um, if anyone wants to talk at any time, please raise your hand, and we will.
pin your video. Um, actually, just before we get on to the second point. Kit Baker, that's my cat. Yay. <laughs> Let's go, Kit. Let's hear from Kit Baker. Go ahead, go ahead, Kit Baker. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great, well, uh, first of all, I'd like to give a shout out to Siobhan, um, who has been doing, yes, who has been doing an online performance serial for two years now. Um, and I think, I mean, for me, that's been possibly the most significant engagement with theater that I've had in that period. And it's relevant because, you know, a lot of people who are coming were devastated by the pandemic and actually found a community addressing that particular part of the regenerative uh, role of, of, of theater involvement. Um, and I think they, they, people, it was really amazing watching what people got out of it. And we heard some pretty, quite honestly, harrowing stories of what people had been through in their lives and the, the ability to share it over this, you know, kind of digital space. I would never have thought that it would actually have a transformative effect, but now, you know, we're friends. Well, uh, Siobhan called them friends and lovers, which was slightly tongue in cheek, but it turned out to be true. There are couples who have been formed and babies to come from that uh, theater ensemble experience. Um, but personally, I'm working in Colorado for the past three years. I've been working a lot with indigenous artists and um, for me, that's, uh, that's the uh, kind of, in a way, activist aspect of my work that, you know, I support these indigenous artists. For example, Greg Deal, who is really uh, very active in um, really, uh, well, sort of resetting our understanding of who we are in America, basically. Um, so I, that has been profoundly um, profoundly uh, life-changing. So in, in, in a lot of ways, that's, that's a focus that I feel is very powerful in the present moment, given the awareness of indigenous artists and indigenous issues and the fact that we're on indigenous land is, um, is playing a big role. I, I, just one example before I uh, stop this video, but um, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez was in a hearing uh, just the other day about um, how the regenerative potential for indigenous practices that are, are many and various and were actually on the list of measures being, uh, being proposed in that committee meeting in Washington. Um, and that really reflects you know, my engagement primarily through art, hopefully more in theater, because there are some really good indigenous uh, actors in Denver and there, there's a lot of potential for more ensemble work by indigenous um, artists here. Um, but, but that's just a, an example of where I find my bliss. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kit. Okay, babies. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. <laughs> totally. Does anyone else want to share anything before we move on to the next section? Anyone else? We'd love to celebrate you. Carrie J. Cole. Apologies, my my um, Zoom. You know, I, I'm having technology issues on my end a bit too. Uh, so um, it took me a while to get my hand up there. But hi from uh, Tucson in uh, Arizona time, Pacific time, whatever time I'm in. Um, I just wanted to say thank you all um, uh, for sharing uh, your um, wow. The first word that came to my mind was ecstasy in terms of the work that we're doing um, in, in the midst of um, some really adverse or challenging uh, conditions. The, um, the pandemic for me has been all of the things that we've been talking about, um, but 
uh, even in the adversity, also uh, a great gift in so many ways to be able to stop and, and do the reassessing that we sometimes don't give ourselves the opportunity to do because we're um, as as artists in our current U.S. culture, we're still breaking down that grind culture of we have to be doing, we always have to, to have three things laid out. And I have um, uh, been embracing monotasking and working on one thing at a time. Um, and in doing that, have found the space for um, my own advocacy work, um, particularly right now, um, we've we've been talking a, a lot about that, and that was re- really resonating with me. In particular, um, uh, looking at um, uh, the aging of individuals, the aging of myself, um, and also the aging of some of our um, ensembles um, and um, uh, theater structures that don't serve us uh, in the way that we assumed that they always would. Um, and uh, so for me, the, what, I've, what I've come to embrace is um, a bit of dismantling of institutional structures. I'm sure my department chair w- will love hearing that. Um, uh, actually, probably he, he would. I'm, I'm, uh, I say dismantling, and I think that what I'm always looking for now are the, the colleagues that and collaborators and co-conspirators who are um, embracing that change, um, even when it is incredibly uncomfortable, especially when it's in- incredibly uncomfortable. So. Um, I just wanted to share um, my my particular moment right now and uh, my admiration for the work that um, uh, we are all doing uh, at this moment. So thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Hey, Catherine, do you want to want to go next? Hello. Yes, I can go next. Can y'all hear me? Oh, coolio. Hello, y'all. My name is Catherine Baena Benitez. I use they, them, and ella pronouns. I am a queer indigenous human tuning in from Lenape land, aka New York City. Um, I believe the question was, what, it, what am I finding like blissful moments in, correct? Or like, what is like some joy that I'm feeling? Right? Yeah, yeah. and things you've already done that um, that are bringing you closer to a kind of ideal world, an ideal kind of work that you aspire towards. Right. So I do a lot of like indigenous storytelling um, and I use a lot of reclaiming of language. So my language is Nawa, which is like a language that is like, like you like there's a lot of erasure of native language. Correct. You know, as we know, there's like a lot of erasure happening in general. Um, So what I do is I intentionally write pieces that come from my own identity as a two-spirit queer human, but also like acknowledging that we need to have deeper conversations of other native languages in the room. So like what brings me joy right now and what I'm practicing is how can I invite more indigenous artists into the space that do not speak Nahua, but speak different languages. And that brings me joy because we can all be in a room together in a circle gathering and there's different languages, all these languages that were taken from us and that now we can talk and bring them into the world, like actually allow them to be alive in ways that, um, it wasn't always allowed to. So that's what's currently bringing me joy. It's like, I'm trying my very best to be intentional of how to bring those voices forward. Because if I don't, and if I don't find a way of bringing us together, then how will we find those spaces of communal, like sharing and ceremony and ritual? Because there's something so beautiful that happens when we can share music with our tongues, when we can share like um, ceremony with our sage, our palo santo, or any of the things that we use to like ensure that we carry ourselves with energy, with light and joy. Um, I'm also like being intentional of like how I carry myself in spaces. I realize that I'm going into spaces more so where it's only me and that's a lot of labor. Um, It can be very difficult for my spirit. 
So um, I always try to invite somebody else of my identity or similar into the space. I was like, come with me. I think about Maya Angelou. She's like, I need you. Come with me. I invite you into the space. Come with me. Um, so that's what's bringing me joy. And the more that I see us in spaces, that excites me because we are very deserving of being in these spaces. We are. And I, and I hope that we can continue moving forward into a narrative of creating art where we see more of our indigenous siblings into this space. So yeah. Thanks, y'all. Hey, absolutely. Wow, absolutely. Thank you everyone so much for sharing about your joys and blisses and ecstasies. Um, I think that, that leads us really well into our next section. Um, you know, as we started talking about regenerativity and what the future could feel like and look like, we kind of heard three different paths that folks were taking um, either at the same time, like multidimensionally, or choosing one path. And as Carrie said, monotasking that one path, um, which was, um, it, it felt like some folks were dismantling, abolishing, ending systems that no longer serve us, systems and structures that no longer serve us. Um, some folks are in this kind of like central center path are figuring out which groups, which institutions, which structures have a capacity for change and are transforming them. Um, and then this kind of third group we saw are holding and building the next world. Um, and so we, we really heard, heard those, those three main paths when we were asking people about the future and about where they wanted to be growing, growing, in, growing towards. And we wanted to utilize that kind of, those three ideas uh, to guide us in this next section. Um, so I'd love to invite everyone to do a visualization for a moment before we talk about this next part. So folks at home, if you can also close your eyes and um, find a comfortable way to sit, find your feet on the floor, connect your, your bottom to the chair, the ground, or your feet deeper into the floor if you're standing. And we want you to recall memories where you felt supported to be creative and brave, um, where you felt creatively cared for. We want you to really embody those moments. You know, for me, I think about my first black acting teacher and we were in this really rundown children's theater, but he introduced me to liberation work. And I just think about like the way he invited me to be free and to be wild. And I think about that caring. I feel that really well in my like, I don't know, my shoulders feel like warm and they feel aligned when I think about that moment. So I'd love to take a few moments for everyone to just recall some of those memories for themselves. Where you felt brave to be creative, where you felt safe enough to imagine. Where you felt held and uplifted. Where does that sit in your body? Does the memory come in a physical, come in a physical way? Does it connect to a physical place on your body? Let's take another minute to just breathe into those memories. Maybe share our gratitude to those memories.
And when you're feeling like you have a, a bit of a fuller picture, a fuller remembrance of that memory, you can open your eyes and come back into the space. Um, you know, I invited y'all to do that because when we were talking to people in the book and we would ask, um, we would ask, you know, what, why regenerativity and what future, hello, welcome. Um, what, what does the future look like for you? So many folks during COVID said, I hope my work become, like, I don't have to do this work anymore and I just want to rest. And, you know, we felt this immense exhaustion, exhaustion, like just run dry from so many people. Um, but when folks connected to their, to the physical, to their physical embodied memories of this creative bravery and of this joy, it allowed them to start dreaming into a future. And so we'd love to just hear from y'all, you know, being rooted in those good memories and in those good thoughts. Um, what, what does a regenerative future look like for you? You know, like what, what would, it can be really specific or it can be broad, it can be surreal or it can be realistic. Um, and how do we bring those kind of three ideas, you know, of dismantling, harm reducing, building, you know, how do we bring that idea into that visualization? So for example, I think about housing, you know, I think about like, I just, want to have a home and a place to live and I don't know when I let's let's talk about that first you know what would what would a solid space look like for you and then next we can envision we can pick a few and maybe build out what those three kind of paths look like towards that so if anyone wants to share what what a regenerative future feels like for them or might look like for them I'd love to love to hear it. No solutions needed yet. We can brainstorm some of that together, but we'd love to hear some of your dreaming and envisioning around that first. And anyone in the chat too can join us on that. Thank you. <laughs> it's Leo season, y'all. Um, <laughs> uh, this. Mm -hmm. For me, again, it cycles in around this piece about healing. I think that in these past two years, I've had time. I was tired. I've let a lot of things go. I'm trying to retrain my brain. I've been looking back at the things, the situations, the things that my trauma is based upon that allow me to be a very open and tender person. And I want to infuse that into my art. I'm interested in like inviting people into a space to share like memory in a way that is not um, continuing harm, but allows space to like think about the different ways in which uh, the world tries to annihilate us, but also then like allows me or a person listening to like sense that like we've always been free certain way like free to choose and I think that like the ways in which the world exists but like being able to see the different ways in which everything is inter intersecting but also realizing the ways in which we are all intersecting with one another um I'm excited about continuing to like make work and see other work resonating um in the atmosphere. So I'm starting to see other artists doing work that doesn't look like the work that I saw when I was growing up, but I'm starting to see it happening. And I feel that like continued resonance is necessary, even though I see what the, I see how the government, <laughs> specifically any, anything that Congress is doing or the Supreme Court, but I'm like, I see that, but I also see that we in this room are here we are still alive. We've got this far. Our ancestors have been calling us in saying, I need you. They're inviting us. And so inviting them to like continue with us on this road forward. 
it's a long game that's thousands of years old. I'm excited. I'm like, let's just keep going. This is an opportunity to resonate. Um, yeah, I'm excited to like do that in tender and gentle ways. Oh, hello. Yeah. Oh, that was beautiful. I was just sitting there kind of just um, um, sitting in the moment of thinking about the language you had shared. Thank you for those good ideas. Um, I just wanted to share um, this. This is partially in response to the last question and this question. So in a lot of the spaces, I'm working with marginalized people. So we're being worn down by just the regular rhythms of the world. We're being worn down by everything. So the question is, how can we make all of our spaces regenerative, replenishing? How can we make all of our spaces and all of our processing um, pleasurable? So one of the things we noticed was when you're working with exclusively marginalized people and you're working on content that is full of harm, it's full of trauma. As we are working towards our liberation, we are brought into encounter with all of this stuff. So one of the things that we did was we created a relationship repair fund. We put it, we literally budgeted part of our funds to um, repair and replenish ourselves. And so at the end of our beautiful production that was gorgeous, we sat down and we said, how are we feeling? Do we need to do relationship repair? Do we need to actually have a conversation that's facilitated to help repair relationship? Do we need to, do we need to go have a massage? What do we need to do? And we decided to all get ourselves beautiful outfits from Sassy Jones. So I am wearing something that is an artifact of collaboration, of ensemble, of thoughtfulness. And I, I found myself sitting here being like, I feel replenished just wearing this. It's an artifact of great artistic outcomes and beautiful process. I'll then talking. I'm all done speaking and having trouble hearing you now. I can follow. Yeah. Um, something that I've been, uh, or I started doing after my second uh, Zoom show, and I was doing Zoom shows twice a week um, for all of 2020 uh, after, you know, March, right? And what we did after the second show was decide not to ever close the Zoom. Because, you know, when you, when the Zoom thing ends, it just, it just, it's so abrupt and it can be jarring. It's like, oh, and then you're just like out, you know, and my, um, my joker, uh, Janissa, she was like, yeah, Siobhan, I don't know if people want to leave. Like, they don't know where to go, you know, because we would do kind of, we would try to acknowledge each of them and say goodbye, like one at a time. And, and she said, what if like you just let people talk and then you start to just kind of unmute them all and let them talk. And we started to call them after parties where people would it would become like somebody else's cooking show at midnight. It would become someone else's makeup demo at 2 a.m. And nobody had anywhere to, I mean, work was kind of over and all this stuff was like, it was wild, you know? So someone's like, let's do a karaoke from YouTube. And essentially it was that sort of like, um, and I love the reframing of, I, I appreciated so much your, your presentation at the beginning talking about everything is like sustainability, sustainability. And it does speak to the exhaustion you were talking about and the like survival that we're all kind of like, it's so tense, you know, and I have never really imagined, I don't really imagine beyond sustainability, honestly, because I'm so like stressed out and, you know, sad. So, but keeping like a Zoom open, if in the, in the physical space, we can't, right? Because we paid for the space, we're like, we got to get out, we got to load out. But on Zoom, for me, it was like, at a certain point, I'm like, okay, I'm going to change into my pajamas. And I would like, you know, turn off my camera and they got it. They're talking. And if Kit is still here, those relationships forming, what he's talking about is just people having the space of having some sense of togetherness mm -hmm. in a time where nobody had that and forming new relationships, which we as, as beings you know, thrive on, um, gave us gave a sense of that kind of like possibility, even in this all of this devastation of like hope and, and moments of joy and humor and uh, connection. And I think 
I'm always seeking those things in, in my life and talking about the kind of art that we make, how we can continue to create space that is comfortable for everybody. Um, and I appreciate everything Claudia was saying too, because joy is so important um, and, uh, and so difficult to find. So um, yeah, that's what I wanted to share. Okay. Hi, I'm Elise. I'm an ensemble theater maker in Philadelphia. I go to Pig Iron, um, originally from LA. Now I live in Philadelphia. Um, yeah, the idea of like free, like we're already free, like that was something that I found really resonating from what you said. And I think something that's like really powerful about like deciding to be an artist is that there's like no one way to get there. And I find that like is really challenging because it's not a guarantee, like it, you can't map it out, unfortunately. Like there's just so many different things to think about and there's not one route there. And I like just recently left a job and it was like a survival job to make sure I could like keep doing theater in Philadelphia. And it was like a summer situation. And I just felt like it was really beginning to feel like not worth it. But I was like, well, I just, I need this like, $2,500 in order to like come back to Philadelphia and like be an artist here. And then I was like, oh, I don't think I can do it anymore. And so I like, I resigned. And then like the next day I like, I heard back from like a scholarship that I applied to. And it was like for $500 more than I would have made from that job. And <laughs> it just felt like a cosmic sort of like reminder that like, there's not one way to get to where you want to go. And they're like, limitless possibilities for like how you can ensure that you get to be an artist. Yeah, I feel like the invitation is a really beautiful one because I'm gonna unwrap this microphone so I can sit back, hold on. Okay, um, because I feel like when you ask that question, which is like, what does something around, what does thriving look like? Or like, what do you want your thriving? I was like, oh my God. I spend so much time trying to like get like figure out <laughs> what something could look like that like that type of envisioning like what if I really got anything that I wanted isn't a space that I've had a lot of time for so thanks for that and for the invitation of like it's already here from both of you um yeah so I'm gonna try uh, when I think about the things that I, I want to be able to have a family where I care for small ones and where that doesn't mean that I can't make art and where it doesn't mean that I can't make art that takes like, I want to be able to take six years to make a piece if that's how long the piece takes. Um, and, uh, if it's generative that whole time, um, I want to be able to like end things when they're over and begin things when they should begin rather than having to be. Uh, in funding cycles that ask me for uh, specific start and end dates that sometimes outlive a project or sometimes end it too soon. That was what I don't want, but uh, uh, <laughs> I'm trying, I'm really trying. I want like space where intergenerational making and gathering can happen that both like has structure, but also can sometimes be unstructured um, and joyful inside of both of those things. Yeah, I want to be able to tell my students that they can make a living doing what we do and that it can be a um, generative thing even if they don't come from money, which I think is a real problem. Okay, those that's I played out. Thank you. <laughs> well, we lift we lift that all up. We lift that all into the earth and all of everything everyone shared. Hmm? No, I just I just love that you also said what you didn't want. <laughs> no, because that's part of figuring out the vision. So that, that's, I mean, I'm someone who I feel like sometimes I've been told, oh, you're too critical. But if that's what you see, it's what you see. What are you supposed to do with it? So I appreciate that you said that. Yeah, and that's how we wrote the book, y'all. <laughs> literally that interplay <laughs> um thanks for sharing that y'all um yes and lift 
lift all those wants, lift all your wants. Um, I just wanted to, you know, something Claudia said about making space for the humanity around the piece as well. You know what I mean? I feel like part of writing this book during the great uprisings of 2020 was like, how do we also embody abolitionist principles into our theater spaces? Um, and I feel like, you know, this idea that we are already free, you know, what Claudia brought up about how do we make space for repair, space and resources for the repair, you know, how do we sandwich the creation with the room for the humanness around it? Um, and I'll quote um, solidarity economy artist Caroline Wooler talks about like, if the art is the shiny apple, you know, we have to give just as much value to the branches and the tree and the trunks and the root and the mycelium, you know, so I'm really excited to live into that, you know, how do we uplift and value and center everything that holds the apple just as much as we value that apple. Um, and so I just wanted to see if for this next section, if folks wanted to talk a little bit about how we make some of these things come true, you know, like how do we use our, I feel like so, one of the things I learned through the pandemic is that our theater toolkits are community organizer toolkits and that if we make ourselves useful with political organizers, with community grassroots organizers, y'all, the potential that I'm sure many of you have seen and many of you shared what that can hold. Um, so I'd love to, you know, unite our visions here and in the digital realm to talk about how we might make space for some of these visions. You know, like how, how do we make room for tenderness and healing in our, in our processes? You know, what's, what, how do we create the environment and the culture where that's actually lived and not just um, theorized? You know, I hear a lot of people like saying they wanna be caring and con having these concepts of care, but like, how do we actually like prepare ourselves to, to make that, that space, you know? So that, that was one I was thinking on. So if anyone else wants to, wants to share more visions or wants to lean into each other's and share some ideas around building that, um, yeah, I've found supporting people and learning how to communicate directly um, and how to untangle tensions through repair has created more space for existing within a caring and nurturing and tender process. That's how I've been trying to hold that as well in my work. I was thinking a million things after you said that, right? And then I had to distill it to like this foundation, which is um, self-love, you know? And it's some of the hardest, right? Cause it's like, how do we have a caring space? Well, when I was thinking about that in theater, people come in and it's a competitive field and we don't feel like we have enough and we're all fighting over, you know, and there's like this, this, this kind of energy that I've felt unwelcome in a lot of theater spaces, you know, and I felt like people come to my stuff not wanting to like it, you know, or wanting to criticize me. And, and I think like the, for me, like going through all the things I'm going through and currently on quite a therapy journey, et cetera, is very much like if I can hold the love and confidence for myself, then I'm creating the stable, I'm, I'm starting with the stable foundation and then I can invite others into it. Like it's safe to be here with me. I've got myself and, and, I've, and I've got enough for you and you can get yourself, you've got enough for the next person, you know, and we can sort of hold that. And it's so difficult for so many reasons. I think primarily, you know, our system or the, what we're born into, it, we're, it's designed for us to not hold that for ourselves, that love and that confidence and that self-esteem that allows us to have some for others. So I think if we give time to that for ourselves, then we'll begin to build like the force field that lets other people um, in. Yes. Um, 
I just want to piggyback off of that. Um, uh, I just want to say like checking the stigma of the language and like shifting mindsets, like the idea, <laughs> I got this journal from somebody is like current part-time struggling artist, soon to be a full-time struggling. I'm like, I want this journal because I am like flying through journals right now. So I was like, I'm not going to waste this paper. So I took some like masking tape and wrote over it. Full-time abundant artist ha and part-time abundant artist. Like I don't have time for this nonsense, but like, there's so many little things that like, they're just, there's so much stigma. Like I, and also um, a dear friend of mine, Tamania Garza uh, was in a, a theater space with us. She's a director and she had this concept that she calls radical care. Uh, or no, I'm sorry, radical grace is what she calls it. And so she brought that into like um, a play space. And essentially the, the idea behind it is that it's people over process over product in like that order. And so um, there were, you know, we built like a set of like community agreements and we built like what a ritual in and a ritual out at the end of the day. And then like things, we built a really beautiful trusting space. And then we also like people in the room were also like parents. And so we like made space for like their needs as well. And had like daycare, uh, not daycare, but like quiet spaces. Um, and then we got into tech and that's when the machine really starts to like work itself. Cause like everybody's like things just happen. And then we had a moment that kind of like where several people were harmed in the matter in the space of like five minutes. And at the end of the night, Thankfully, we had made a space to be like, let's talk about what's just happened here. And so people were able to like voice what was, how they'd been hurt. And people were also able to like see how they had hurt people. I had hurt someone in this space because I was hurting. And so, you know, we like took the time and everybody was able to like speak. And then we were like able to go home and come back. But because we built that trust, we were able to come back to that trust. So like, Yes, and yes, self love and like having having that well. I've been thinking about like a well, and like the well is always full. It's overflowing, in fact. And then the work goes like the work outside of it goes from the overflow. So that if anything feels like it's pulling from your well, that's that's when it's got to go. It's a signal. Resonate. Mm -hmm. Leavers love Leos. Good. Kit, did you want to say something, Kit? Sure. Yeah, first of all, really quickly, I would like to attest to the fact that uh, this is not the first time that uh, Siobhan has been overwhelmed by millions of ideas. It happens all the time, and it's a joy to watch. Um, I, 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 for me, it's really a question of continuing in terms of, you know, what to do next, in a way. Um, it's continuing my work with... Uh, indigenous artists and what I've learned over the past few years of working directly with indigenous artists and members of, you know, the community. And I, you know, again, million things, but three particularly stand out. Um, one is that I learned from um, leaders that uh, the principle of staying one step behind. So as a white man, not kind of imposing my own working methods, et cetera, which was initially very frustrating because I'm working with indigenous artists to find the resources, to get grants, to, you know, kind of develop strategies, organizational strategies, which I used to do in New York. And of course, in New York, you know, you're always behind. So you're always kind of pushing to get ahead. This is, to this is quite the opposite that I had to fulfill a role where I was actually very patiently waiting and just, you know, feeding things in much slower than I was comfortable with. Um, and so that was, that's a principle that I'm, I fully intend to keep going on uh, going forward. Um, and actually probably the biggest uh, impact, the biggest thing I learned over the last three years was from a Lakota um, leader, uh, Tatewi Means, who's the daughter of Russell Means, who was very active in the AIM movement. Um, and she was talking about something that is widely known, but it was the first time I'd really encountered it 
uh, and it was actually on an Art Place America Summit where she spoke. And it's thinking in terms of seven generations. So that you're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it for the, you know, the seven generation, seventh generation to come. And for me, that completely transformed the goal of my work. And, you know, we all work according to production schedules, which are very focused on the next few months, possibly a year if we're lucky. Um, so that was so freeing and, and actually really uh, basically ventilated my head to think in those terms. And, and um, yes, it was mentioned before, take six years to do a production. It's that kind of thing that I think is, uh, is uh, you know, not really recognized as a valid way of working in our society, but it is. <laughs> And uh, that's one aspect where I get huge inspiration from, from that kind of, you know, that Lakota tradition, um, to be specific. And, I, and then I started noticing it, for example, in the work of Romeo Castellucci, the Italian stage auteur, etc. It's everywhere. And you can access it. Uh, the final thing is, I was working with a Navajo um, leader in Fort Collins. She organizes the powwow up there and she's uh, she works closely with the CSU, the Native American Cultural Center there. And for when I first started working more, nothing seemed to happen. I was work, you know, meeting with her for a year and nothing seemed to happen and it was frustrating. And then I got to know her and really put in the effort to stay one step back. And one day I was talking with her and, and trying to kind of get things going. And then she said to me, and I think it was because we'd become friends and she felt comfortable saying it, she said, I just want to do it in the right way. So I'm kind of learning how long it takes to do things in the right way and, and much more comfortable um, doing that. Okay, I'll step off there. It's also a Haudenosaunee principle, the seven generation principle. Um, and that, you know, to me, that ties into what Severin was talking about, that like the urgency dropped in in the tech process, you know, and like, how do we hold that kind of container of slowness when we do have to pop back into the machine, you know, or how do we, how do we infiltrate the machine with the slowness too? That's something I've been trying to figure out because it's true. Once you're in there, you're grinding in there. <laughs> that also, I love the whole thing of taking the long view, remembering the long view, which can hit every person with the seven generations. It's, for me, in terms of my calling, one a really important moment was rather than seeing this, you know, love affair I was having with socially engaged theater when it was just really marginalized, um, and, and being pat on the head for being so nice, which I'm really not especially nice. I realized I was part of the long tradition. If you look at what art has done through time, it's the kind of thing we've been talking about. And the much faster, snappier, um, sort of, um, some of it's wonderful and exciting. It's not like it has to be either or, but nonetheless, it sits in a much longer tradition that includes all of this. And I find that a helpful perspective to remember. Uh, also, uh, Kit made me think when he said about being a step behind, and, and you also made me think when you mentioned Roots, um, Alternate Roots, the wonderful organization in the South, Regional Organization of Theater South. Um, they say, if you're someone who tends to step forward a lot, challenge yourself to step back a little. If you're someone who tends to step back, challenge yourself to step forward. And that's one of their kind of community agreements, which I always find very interesting what it puts us all through to, to, to try to do that. Um, I think we're pretty much near the end of the workshop. And actually, I wondered if, if I thought it would be nice to give anybody physically or digitally here a moment. If there's any reflection, any final reflection you'd like to make, um, we would just love to hear it. It's been nice to hear so many different metaphors that are really practical and helpful. 
today, like the uh, the blue apple and valuing the branch in the root of the stem, and the idea that self care uh, means that you're with the ability to be a safe space for somebody else. I never really thought of that. I just wanted to bring that up. This has been really wonderful, and for me, and partly, it's the reminder that you guys started with and sort of moved through, which is the, some of the answers are already things that we've done or are in the deepest calling, and and I've been sitting on this because I didn't really feel like I should participate entirely. Um, but when you asked about callings, I remembered something I did years and years ago. In, graduate school that became a, a, a piece, a theater piece that we called Collins. And it began with the question, who do you wanna to talk to? Which began with me on a trip by myself being very lonely and having conversations with absent people, imaginary people, fictional people. And I started to think just today, how much personal calling has to do with also the calling to someone else who isn't there, and um, and that's a and I thank you for that because for me personally it's a really profound connection that's been sitting there in plain sight for forty years in my life, but I uh, I needed you to get. Yeah, I also think that the starting the conversation about how to have generative sustainable or regenerative work with the question of like why knowing why the work is happening it has been really profound because i still even at the end when you asked the question about care i was thinking oh well okay i think we need to do less with more okay so how do we get the more so then i started like my fundraising brain is going again and so it's really nice to like keep kind of touching back into this, like there's lots of ways to make the work regenerative and lots of resources that we have that are not only the resources that come to us from the people who hold the checkbooks. Um, and sometimes it's not the resource. I was just like, we're all, I, I a thing that I'm in the space of believing right now is that like we're all artists even when we're not making art and that art existed before the structures in which we make them right now and then like how do we how do we make more and do less right um but yeah yeah I don't know art's a birthright <laughs> that's all we're art just by being here by breathing Uh, my super tangible thing that I've been trying to do is um, have a time that I stop working in a day. And then I have to do something fun. I have to, even if it's just reading or having a drink, or like sometimes I schedule something that I need to go to or attend, you know, whatever go to means. But um, because I uh, am, you know, brainwashed by the capitalist like system and I feel guilt when I haven't accomplished things when I feel that I, when I miss out on things or I don't get the grants or whatever it is, I feel bad about myself. And that makes me feel like when I go to bed at night, I didn't do enough, you know, and I'm like forcing um, the time that I stop and I do something that brings me joy that is not work. And I don't know if I can offer that as well as a thing to try to implement. It's very challenging, but um, it does have a lot of rewards. I mean, I guess my, the last thing I'd want to say today is, is, is thank you for letting us do this experiment with you. Um, not just the Zoom and the live and coming out when COVID is, you know, popping up again um, and, and howl around, including it in their archive, which is such an honor. Um, but for us to have spent this time writing the book and then saying, but we don't want to just come in and give a talk about the book. We, we're starting, we want to try to find a way 
um, that we're continuing to hear more from people. We're, these ideas are alive and moving and that you're helping us keep them moving by trying to do this kind of hybrid presentation. So we're, this is the first one we've tried to do. The book just came out in June. So thank you so much for bearing with us in this experiment that we're doing. Yeah, ditto. Thank you. Thank you. It was so nice to see all of you and hear your, hear your, hear your contributions. Thank you. 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 See y'all soon. Thank you. <laughs> really, a wonderful way to start out our first net thing back and um and thanks to the folks on zoom and how round for um your patience as we took time to get started and had some glitches along the way and thank you for bringing everybody including the people on zoom and online into the room because we just need to be together so badly so thank you for that and thanks y'all for being here i'm going to turn this over to our executive director, Alicia Tonsik. Zoom folks, hello HowlRound folks. Thanks for being part of this amazing experiment day we're doing. Um, like all of you, we like to co-create at NET and we like to try things. And we know that we're in this space where we're all gonna be trying a lot of this kind of stuff for the next who knows how long. So we figured we'd stick our necks out a little and see what we could learn on behalf of all of us. So thank you for being part of that learning. It's going to keep going through the day. Um, the next thing that we are about to move on to, for those of you who are staying with us or joining, um, we're going to move into some uh, casual break time uh, for some net dates. Uh, so those are just meetups. Um, you can do those either with folks here in the room, go out someplace in Philly, have, have some lunch, um, if you are someone who's on Zoom with us uh, and you have registered, you will get a link uh, to come to a different Zoom room, and we will uh, magically put you in some little small groups to meet up with some folks for some meal conversation. Um, I want to just thank uh, all of you. Thanks for the starting out. I was still doing some logistics out there in the front, um, but that is why we do Ensemble, because it means that my fantastic board member, uh, Todd London was able to get us started this morning, so thank you for that, Todd. Um, and thank you to both of you for a workshop that was a really wonderful way for us to start the day. Um, I really want to give big thanks to James and Ben here in the space with us, uh, who, who are responsible for some of this technical wizardry that we are asking of folks. Um, also, Adam uh, Cooper Turan will be joining us later today as well as our technical director for the event. And Three of them have really been working hard to try to figure out how to do some of these things that we're saying, no, 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 we want in the room, but also how around, but also Zoom, but also, and can they talk to each other? So thank you for the work to make this happen. And we'll keep learning. Um, so go have yourself some lunch or breakfast for my West Coast um, compatriots. Uh, I'm usually out there with you uh, or coffee break or whatever else. And hopefully come on back with us later this afternoon. Oh, sure, of course. Um, I will say the, the best way, go to the NET website and you can get all of the details if you don't already have them. Uh, but after we come back from the break, we'll have a wonderful conversation between Rodessa Jones, who has just arrived here uh, from the Bay Area to Philly for the year. She'll uh, be spending the year here as a Pew Fellow. Um, and so she's going to have a conversation with Godfrey Simmons, who's another of our fabulous board members at NET. Uh, who's the artistic director of Heartbeat Ensemble in Hartford, Connecticut? Um, just talking about, you know, how do you how do you make a life doing this work over decades and still stay in it um, and joyful and and have the, the spirit to keep going? Um, so that's going to be great. And then uh, this later this afternoon, I'm almost tempted to hand to Siobhan, but I won't. Um, uh, so we're going to do a, a kind of three-hour multi-part kind of deal where we'll 
um, go into some small group kind of art-based breakout workshops that will also blend people over Zoom and people in the room here. Uh, and then we'll come back from that into a kind of big community town hall where anybody can just kind of speak their mind. Um, Siobhan is going to be our MC joker, kind of leading us through that whole experience and making sure that the folks in the Zoom and the folks in the room are all being able to interact as best we can. You good? Okay, well, I'm, I'm going to opt out of the baby conversation and take us to our break. But thank you all for being here. Thank you all for being here.